Welcome to the Rapzilla.com track, artist track. Um, we got a very special guy that's gonna. This man, my battery. Yeah. Spiritual. <laughs> he uses it, man, because it's really it's used. Um, we got KB, K to the second letter. Um, just won Dove Award this week. Yeah. Everybody's screaming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all feeling all right this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, I don't do that. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and start us off in prayer. But before I begin, who's in charge of this? Is, this, is it you, Phil? I just need to know how much time I have. Say so, what? I have until 11.30? Okay. I have you on here all day. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you for your grace, O oh Lord. And your mercy that is new to us every morning. Lord, you have been more kind than any of us could imagine. Truly more kind to us than any of us deserve. Lord, you've been more loving towards us than, than we can comprehend. Lord, what we would do to each other, reject one another, turn our backs on one another, be done with one another. You've done the opposite. You've embraced us, Lord God. You've embraced us, showing that you're nothing like us. You are not like man. You're in a class of your own, Lord God. Therefore, lives everywhere should be lived for you. Music everywhere should be made for you. We exist for you, oh God. It is you who have made us. We have not made ourselves. Lord, that is our conviction. And I pray, oh God, that you would bless that. Because men didn't teach us this. Heaven revealed this to us. I pray, Lord, that you would water that, extend it this morning, oh God. Enlarge our hearts, oh Lord, that the reason we exist would be all the more clear, we'd be all the more confident in it, and it'd be all the more obvious to the world that watches, that they would want to join in their purpose. We live for you. Lord God, please join us in this session this morning. Open our hearts and our mind to think about these things, oh God. As we consider art, as we consider success and selfish ambition, as we consider what it means to be stewards of what you've given us. This is big, oh God. You're going to ask us about this stuff when we stand before you. Give us answers this morning, oh Lord. Join us. Please help this center up here. In my heart, oh God. I want to be humble before you, that you be pleased to use me. This is the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. amen, amen. Flavor Fest 2014 is on. I remember when this was back on North Orleans. Remember that? We got some legacy members here. Uh, so we've come a long way. Uh, so today's uh, session that I'm doing this morning is on uh, success, selfish ambition, and vocation. Hey, baby, you made it. Everybody say hi to my wife. I had to leave her in the parking lot. I had husband. So running here. And I think these areas are probably three of the most crucial areas for us. Whether you're an artist or not, uh, normally I do this talk for men, but it applies to females as well. How do we deal with success, our own selfish ambition, in the topic of vocation, because we gotta ask some questions. What are you aiming for? What are you aiming for? What's at the bottom of your ambition? Why do you want to be the things that you say you wanna be? Why do you wanna be successful? Why do you want to be successful? Now the world has equipped us with answers to this pretty strongly. And unfortunately, some of us believe their answers to that question. 
If I were to ask you why did you want to be successful, or if you could name for me successful people, who would be your top 10 greatest people? Who would make that list? I wonder if our list would look like God's list, or if it'd be different. I think about Michael Jordan. He would be a picture of success. ESPN writes, Jordan is at the center of several overlapping universes. At the top of a million dollar brand at Nike, he's at the top of the Bobcats, and of his own company, with dozens of employees and contractors on payroll, and in case anyone in the inner circle forgets who's in charge, they only have to recall the code names given to them by the private security team assigned that oversees his trips. They call Esty Venom, they call Judge uh, George Butler, they call Yvette his girl Harmony, and they call Michael Jordan Yahweh, the Hebrew word for God. Six NBA titles, five MVPs, 10 scoring titles, 14 all-star appearances, and many other feats posterized on all of our childhood walls. Michael Jordan walks nowhere, and he's not the most important man in the room. Who has a better story than him? Go out to dinner with him and tell your story. I made the honor roll last week. Oh, really? I conquered the NBA. Michael Jordan is the man. Yet and still, ESPN writes, even with all that Michael has, he says, this year, he's not happy. He says, he will never be happy unless he can play basketball again. They say, how do you get over it, Michael? He says, you don't get over it. You just deal with it. He tries to golf. He tries to pursue other things, but nothing can satisfy this unquenchable thirst he has to be back where he was. He said he pays attention to everything that people say. All those conversations about LeBron and Kobe and all that stuff, he's peering into that online. And it hurts him that his throne is in question. He lives for basketball. This is an uncommon story. You see, because basketball cannot answer the question of why you're created. That's what we're all searching for. Why can't basketball do it? Because basketball was created. It can't give you, it can give you a sense of purpose, a, a sense of meaning, but it's not the real thing. And eventually, if what you're living for, what you're aiming for, is a created thing, it will explode in your face. And you will suffer. But isn't at the bottom of what we're all looking for, a type of salvation? We, we, want, we want to be safe. You see, the, the, the world has a gospel just like the church does. They have a salvation just like the church. You see, their salvation is, don't you want to be rich, sexy, important, famous, people to follow you, like you on Instagram and Facebook? That's what it means to be saved, sexy, smart, successful. And then in that salvation, it leads to this justification, all by works. Don't you want to be justified by your peers? They look at you and say, man, he's dope. Or she can sing. They affirm you. Guys, a lot of you are single because your standards of what you want in a woman are just stupid. You want your girl, when you walk in with her, you want everybody to be like, whoo, that's you? Yeah. <laughs> or the clothes that we buy, go broke looking rich, buying shoes we cannot afford, so that when we walk in, people say, you got those? Justified by those around us. And then there's sanctification. <laughs> Being made like this image of salvation. Every day trying to improve myself, improve myself, getting better. And it's nothing wrong with self-improvement, but what are you doing it for? Oh, that I could get more salvation. People would look at me and think I'm somebody. Brothers and sisters, Christian hip-hoppers and singers, how many of us are right there? We put the glory of God banner on what we're doing, but it's not His glory. That's why we're so upset when we don't get it. We gotta ask ourselves these questions because it's danger if we don't. One thing is that gospel 
and selfish ambition are not compatible. Two implications of that. You will never be happy chasing status. You just won't be. Ask the rich who commit suicide far more than the poor do. But not only that, we're Christians. We believe that God is going to judge those who have made their life about themselves. So on one end, you can't be happy chasing status. You are literally too small for yourself. You need something greater to satisfy you. And on the other hand, I think about what Jesus said to the rich man, who's like, man, I got so much money, what am I gonna do with it? I know what I'll do. I'm gonna build bigger barns and store all my stuff in it. And Jesus looks at the man and says, <laughs> Fool, your soul is required of you tonight. And everything you built your life on trying to get, it's going to be somebody else's. That's what it is. We all want to be known. And God put that in us. We should be known. But known by who? Because if my aim is to be known by everybody, let me go ahead and save you some trouble. You're wasting your time. Because you will be forgotten. Go ahead and throw your hands up if you know your great granddad. One, two, you know your great granddad? You know your great granddad. What's his? You know him? Three dudes, like 70, four, five. Who knows their great great granddad? He know who he is. Go ahead. Do you, you know? Nobody knows his name, nobody knows what he was like, know what he was into. Yet, without him, you wouldn't be here right now. The legacy of your family is built on that man. It was probably him that came over from West Africa to this country and made it through slavery for some of my Africans in here. For you to be able to live and experience some of the freedoms of this country. And you don't even know his name. What is that? We are all on that trajectory. Your kids, 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 kids are not going to care who you are. You will be forgotten. God is wanting us to be okay with that. Why? Because he has an alternative for selfish ambition as a means of success. And that alternative is what we're going to talk about today. And that is vocation. Vocation is a funny word. But vocation is, uh, it comes from a Latin word that means calling. Okay? It used to be more popular in the church, but I don't use it much anymore. But it means calling. Vocation means calling. Success should be a byproduct of vocation. Meaning, I'm not chasing success, but I'm chasing a calling. And if I chase the calling well, there will be a level of success. But success is centered, I'm sorry, is the byproduct of this pursuit. The prime product is vocation. So at the end of everything we're doing, the main question is, are you called? Are you called? When I think about um, folks dating, courtship, there must have been a million books and articles written on how to court a lady. A lady, how are you pursued? And a lot of these steps and opinions miss a very crucial piece which is probably one of the only pieces that we find in scripture because believe it or not dating is not in the bible this is not a chapter on it or a book we just pull everywhere to try to figure it i'm not mad at that but i'm just saying but what is in the bible is calling is has god brought me this woman ladies has god brought you that man a good indication is is when he being in your life equals your spirituality begins to fall apart, God has to call that. But if it affirms and it extends, and you can answer that question with confidence, God's called me to this. Because when you get married, if you're not, and all my married men here can attest, it is going to get hard. Man. You remember how cute she was when you first met her? There are going to be days you're going to wake up and be like, that attitude makes you look terrible right now. I need to take a, a walk or something because I'm getting upset. 
I know men. I know men. I talk to a dude, he's a fighter in the gym that I go to. But essentially he's telling me that, bro, I, I just, I don't feel it no more. So I'm, I, I, I got me a couple other girls and we're separated for now. We still barely have a divorce yet, but I feel happier now that I'm not with her. And I feel relief that I told her that I don't want to be faithful anymore. I looked that brother in the face, I said, well, you feel good. He was like, yeah. I said, well, how does she feel? Was to kill herself. Does that not bother you at all? Because what you did wasn't just for you, brother. It wasn't, did you feel good about the decision that you made, therefore keep doing it. The question was, did God put y'all together? Well, if you said, I do, he did. Marriage is of the Lord. He puts folks together. So it's not your opinion or how you feel that determines whether or not you're called. The fact that this is signifies calling, and when it gets tough, that's the only thing that's gonna keep this thing moving. Calling has to be at the center of all that we do. Speaking of this, it's a good segue into what I really wanna get into this evening, or this morning, afternoon, wherever we are. God bless you. It's a lot of what I described in the marriage analogy is our lives. It's tough. And folks would tell you, you know that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing when it doesn't feel like work anymore. I just want to tell you I don't think that's true. Because we live in a fallen world. And you're going to find yourself, especially my men, your manhood shines the brightest when you are not beasting the things you like doing. But when you are beasting the things that you have to do, but they hurt. Mm. That's a man. Preach. You live in the uncomfortable. And there's those moments where heaven sort of breaks through and it's like, I was made for this. This feels right. There's nothing around us. I could do this forever. But that's just not our story, man. Sisters as well. It is difficult at times. It is, we'll find ourselves in a place that we don't want to be. How do we deal with that? I think God has something to say to it. So, I'll start by explaining this theology of vocation with a story of mine. When I was in high school, I got this unique opportunity to start college early. I was 16 years old. Uh, the name of the school that I was a part of was called St. Petersburg Collegiate High School. It was high school and college put together. And essentially, they took students with good grades and they gave them this opportunity to literally finish college, or finish high school, I'm sorry, with a college degree. Now, I don't think it was because I was a genius. I think it's because I was black, and I was from the hood, and I had good grades. And they liked that. They were like, this was a tight man from the hood, and black, and Barack Obama one day. It's pretty <laughs> So obviously, a program like that, the benefits are plentiful. And you get, all of the benefits of a college student, except you don't pay for them. All your classes taken care of. I didn't even realize how amazing that was until I went to Bible college afterwards and I got this bill from the Antichrist himself or herself, Sally Mae. To have your, your, your classes paid for is manna from heaven. Yeah. Also, if I finish this program, I would get automatic acceptance into any college in the state of Florida. That's pretty sweet. Now, as I look back on this period, though, and I can describe my response to such a wonderful situation, I think I would use one word, and it's simple. It is ungrateful. My favorite part of that program, if you were to ask a young KB, what's the best part of each day? You got all these opportunities that can come out of this situation. What's the best part of every day? I would emphatically tell you, if I was honest, I love getting to go home. When that bell rang on, when she said class dismissed, and I got to get in my car and drive home and do nothing, oh, that's what I live. Matter of fact, 
All through school, I cannot remember any better moments. All, even, I guess basketball, that was kind of a release. I got to play ball. But outside of that, when it came to school, the best part of the day was when it was over. Bell ring, we go home. Or PE. That's why we all got straight A's in PE. And that was a break from what we didn't want to be doing. Our futures in those stages is irrelevant. You don't realize that if you don't get your schooling on point, you're going to set yourself up on a trajectory that's going to hurt you in the end. You don't realize that there were some things that you could have learned about responsibility, being on time, how to read. Those type of things are essential to making it in this world. But now I didn't care about any of that stuff. I just wanted to go home. My best friend was leisure. Principally, it was this. There was plenty of benefit, value, purpose, meaning in my situation, but it was all eclipsed by one thing. I did not want to be there, and I'd rather be someplace else. And that is very similar to where a lot of us are in our jobs. We're going to do a workshop today about art. But you do something more than you do art. <laughs> you go to work, or you go to school, or you serve. And this is the backdrop of who you are on that stage. Thank God it's Friday was my motto. And some of you, and it's almost like curse God is Monday for others. The best part of our work is a lot of times not doing it. <laughs> because we are always excited for where, we are never excited, I'm sorry, for where we have to be. Because we're so in love with where we want to be. So we may be a little thankful. I mean, I guess I could be homeless without a job. So thank you, Lord, you did give me this. You were praying so hard, Lord, please, if you opened up this door for me, then you got it, you had a praise report at church. And two weeks later, Man, I gotta find something else, man. Yeah. I know when we were at work, we were rappers. I used to work at Sweet Bay. Anybody know Sweet Bay? Yeah. Shut that mother down, man. Yeah. Turn up, turn up. Shut it down. Rest in peace, Sweet Bay. I remember we used to just get out the way, try to sneak away so we can write rhymes, freestyle. Me and my homie, I mean, used to race down the aisles. That's what we did that was fun at work. I have family members that say, you know what's so good about my job? I don't do nothing at it. I remember being like, what? Where are you working? That sounds like my type of job. Leisure. Unless, of course, I'm doing something that I want to do. But our lives are filled with the opposite. Where does this come from? Why do we find ourselves far more on the ungrateful side than we do on the side of gratitude. Well, for one, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and burst them open. Genesis 1. For one, we feel like work is the product of Adam's stupidity. We're working, like we want to get home and make beats. We want to go rock a show. We want to go meet with some producers. But I got this thorn in the flesh that I have to go to because of Adam. Our favorite words, weekend, PTO, schools cancel, spring break. That's what we would live in if Adam would not have messed it up. But speaking of va uh, uh, vocation and vacations, if we look at Genesis 2 8, let's go ahead and turn there real quick. We're going to see that nobody knew a better vacation spot than Adam. Genesis 2, verse 8. And it says, and the, are we all there? Say word if you're there. Word. Ah, it's Bible readers in here. Verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now we always rush over that verse. But the beginning of it, the first sentence says, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. Now pause, for us who've heard this is overly Christianized culture, we just fly right past that. But think about that. The God of the universe planted a garden. 
God who makes planets, stars, galaxies. He has flowers on mountains that men have never been on before. And those flowers are there so God can look at them. There are endless, as an endless amount of depth to the ocean that we can't get equipment to that has all sorts of creations, things swimming around for whose sake? His sake. He sees that fish down there. He keeps that fish breathing. He is extravagant. He is wonderful. He is the God of the undiscovered. He is a genius. He is splendid. And this God planted a garden. So, that thing must have been nice. It must have been pretty amazing, an enclosed, protected place, sin-free, better than any part of his creation. All the places you've seen in your life on the Grand Canyon, I just got back from Africa, I saw Cape Town with these mountains that went into the ocean. None of that can touch the beauty of this place. This, it was divinely established by God. Nowhere else in all of creation had more God in it than the Garden of Eden. It also says that it was in the east. You ever catch that? Why? Doesn't matter. It's in the east. Well, it was in the east because in the ancient Near East, that was a phrase that they were, it was a direction they would use to represent life, okay? The sun rises on the east. Uh, for example, the Nile, as it runs through, the temples of life are on the east, and the temples of the monuments of death are on the other side, the west, where you find pyramids and tombs. East meant life in the mind of an Israelite. This was the place of life. In addition to that, the word Eden, probably heard this before, it means luxury. So a lot of people name their spas after Eden. A place of life and luxury planted by God himself. And on top of all that, if that wasn't enough, God said, I'm gonna walk with you in this garden. You turn and there's God walking through the garden, observable to you. This place was perfect. But in verse 15, you find something interesting. We have there, the Lord took the man, put him in the garden of Eden, to what? There you go. He put him in the garden to work. So you have work in the garden around perfection. And the verse continues and uses the word, I'm sorry, before it, he used the word put. He put him in the garden to work. That word put there literally means rest, to settle, to like lay down. But he put him in there to rest in his work. work. Not kick, when we think about heaven, we don't even think about someone floating around, drinking iced tea, doing nothing. No, 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 no. That's not the vision of the new heaven and new earth. That was not the vision of Eden. This is a place where folks are working before anything else is happening. God settled them in the garden. God gave Adam a job. It was the first institution. Even before marriage, it was an occupation. Adam was created to work. Few things to note there. This was before the fall. That our work is not a product of sin. Our work is a product of God. If you think a little bit further, who was working before Adam was created? God. In the very nature of our God, He is a worker. Therefore, for us to not be known, this is big for us, because Christians and generations before us didn't have this issue. I don't know if you ever heard of the Protestant work ethic. That's because out of the Reformation, folks were beasts in this. Because they knew this stuff. For us not to be known as hard workers is to be disobedient. Mm -hmm. That's, that's I mean, unless you see something else here. That's good. 
For us not to be hard workers is disobedient. Which makes sense why Paul would say, the man that doesn't work, he should starve. Y'all eat in front of you. You like this, don't you? Yes. Get a job and you can get some too. <laughs> Another thing to notice, Adam didn't choose the job. You ever notice that? He didn't fill out a personality test. God gave him this job. The job didn't just stumble on him too. He said, I was just walking and all of a sudden I found myself working. No, the job didn't choose him. He didn't choose the job. God gave him this job. What do you want to be when you grow up is not as important as what is God calling you to do. God crafted Adam for this work. He had planned it for Adam to walk in. God crafted Adam for this work, planned it for him to walk in. God crafted him for this work and planned for him to walk in. That sound like something to you? Ephesians 2? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is what you're called to, brothers and sisters. To work. Which gets to the heart of our conversation. You have unique gifts that God has given you to carry out what he has called you to do. He's programmed, grabbed, and packaged in your mother's womb a certain set of skills, gifts, passions, and leanings. And your entire life is God cultivating, bringing them out, preparing them for such a time as this. Success is going to be, are you stewarding the gifts he gave you? Or are you sitting around because you're lazy? Some of you are good and all of you are good at something. But nobody is exempt from the hard work that comes along with it. Right. And that is one of our biggest problems, brothers and sisters. When it comes to scripture, we don't dig hard enough. And when it comes to our crafts, we don't dig hard enough. And when it comes to the job that God gave you and called you to, whether it's at Walmart or Verizon Wireless, we don't dig hard enough. Vocation comes from someone calling you to serve, God pointing at you and beckoning you to come for something that's higher than yourself, something more important than yourself. It's not primarily about self-fulfillment. I had a homie tell me, bro, I, I've been working on this degree for three years, but I'm sorry, I, I really just feel like I should do something else. And this, I'm not going to say what it was, but this something else, maybe he wouldn't make any money at all. But I just feel like I like that more. Well, I said, bro, are you good at what you're doing? He said, yeah, I'm good at it. I just don't know if I see myself, you know, doing this every day. I said, it doesn't matter. Is God calling you to it? Because whatever you get excited about for the moment, two weeks in, three weeks in, you're going to be like, ah, I don't feel like doing it anymore. Men, how many pursuits have you had in the last two years? I'm gonna be a bodybuilder. Nah, I'm gonna be like a, like a triathlete or something. Nah, let me try rapping. I mean, I bet cats, we do concerts, they come to you afterward, like, man, I was on my way to doing such and such, but I think I wanna be a Christian rapper now. I said, well, well God bless you, bro. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> what is God calling you to? That's the question. It's gonna get boring. It's gonna get hard. It's gonna get difficult. You're going to want to quit. But that's not the question. I think you know what it is. The first function, this is good. The, uh, well, I think it's good. Right, on myself. Forgive <laughs> me. The very first function Adam has as a man in the garden, before he's a husband, before he's a father, He's a worker. Before naming the animals, before meeting his incredibly beautiful wife, Adam worshiped God 
in the garden as a worker. Mm. No man has ever existed without worship. You were created to worship. Yeah. It's not who you worship, it's who you're going to worship. Because we're all worshiping. Yeah. Adam was a worshiper, worshiper before the means of grace. Listen to this. Before animal sacrifices, Adam was worshiping. Before prayer, Adam was worshiping. Before celebrations of festivals, before church, before music, before anything, Adam was worshiping how? Through work. Which means, this is foundational anything when it comes to vocation. Your work is worship. It is. That's Wendy's. Maybe not Wendy's. That's somebody that sells good food. Walmart. Your contribution is worship. It's not, man, I need to stop stacking these shelves because I need to spend some time with God. Spend God time with God stacking shelves. That's good. If you don't approach your art that way, this isn't an issue if you're a Christian rapper or a rapper that's Christian. Irrelevant for most of us. The question is, is this my reasonable service? See, Sebastian Bach, you remember with him? He used to play his stuff in school all the time. Solid Christian. He had no Christian music. Not one song. Well, there were no words in it, so it'd be hard to tell anyways. But Sebastian Bach said every composition he makes, really? He just, okay. See how they do me, 15 minutes. Every comp composition he made, at the bottom of it, he signed, he signed S-D-G, Soli Deo Gloria, to God be the glory of love. And it wasn't like there was gospel presentations at his concerts. It wasn't like he had literature to give all of the attenders so they could go home and read about the gospel. He put on worship services for his God. Many scientists and philosophers and uh, astrologers had the same take that this is my worship. It doesn't matter how grand or statusy the job is. It's who you're doing it for. You know the Bible, I love the Bible. It's unapologetic about the language it uses. It uses slaves. Come on, God. You know our history. We don't like that word. We don't even joke with each other about that word. But he didn't apologize. As he said, I know what a slave is. A slave is one that completely belongs to someone else. And he said, you, are my slaves. But then he puts a twist on it. Because you're going to be a slave to something. That's what Romans says. You cannot be free. Your only option is to have a good master. And Jesus says, I am that good master. So if our master, think about this, says, I want you in the shed cleaning out those, those, uh, those containers. That's what I want you doing. Nobody sees you. You're just in the shed cleaning out containers. Or if our master says, I want you to be on the front porch playing for thousands. At the end of the day, the slave in the shed or the slave on the front porch, who is he answering to? He's answering to his master. Whether we're on small stages or big stages, irrelevant. We answer to one. Because the slaves understand, it doesn't matter what other slaves think about me. <laughs> it's God who's going to judge. You are responsible for none of your success. Lecrae is responsible for none of his success. You know that? Andy Minio is responsible for none of his success. Trust me, he's one of my good friends. He didn't breathe a certain way in the womb so he could rap well. I get these skills up. <laughs> he did not choose to be a young white man from New York with amazing abilities. Those were not his choices. 
Even if he improved on them, I'm going to write a 16 bar verse every day, which is not a bad idea for us. He's only using the strength that God gave him. You have nothing that you have not received. Paul said, then why do you boast? Yet on the flip side, you're responsible for all your failures. None of your success, all of your failures. So if that is the case, we have no room for being discouraged because we're not as known as others. But that's our struggle. But this is where vocation comes in. God has called me, not other slaves. I'm going to skip a whole lot because I got, I'm going to try to mm, wrap this up in five minutes and then open it up for some questions. So, um, made in the image of God. The image of God is what you represent. It's also a function. You do something, being an image bearer. You create, you work, you represent him. You know, one of the scandals about marriages in the church that end in divorce, which is the biggest problem for the church. Gay marriage is not our problem. We can't stay married to each other. When they do end, we, like no one else, are saying, this is how Christ treats his church. He leaves with the worship. This is how Christ treats his church. He says, I'm just done. And those are lies. And we lie on God in marriage. And we do that with our lives. The image of God on you is to represent him in a way that you tell the truth about who he is. When you're gracious, you're kind, you're good to people. You're saying God is like that. When you're a hard worker and a provider, you're saying God is a provider. Mm. And when you do the opposite, you work against his character, which is blasphemy. And with that, there's a function. So, so I'm just going to just close this and try to sum it up real quick. Brothers and sisters, the function, your purpose in this life is to follow what God is calling you. That's clear. But understand how beautiful this is. Many of us are going to have multiple callings. We all have multiple callings. At one time, you can be called to be a father. And then maybe you can be called to be a pastor. Maybe you can be called to be a leader at a, a juvenile detention center. All of those are called at the same time. How do we know if we're called? If God has gifted you, if God has given you opportunity, and these things produce for you, Meaning there's a need for it. The, the inner section of those three things is where you find your call. For example, I got a friend named Craig. Craig is a garbage man. Craig is probably one of the most joyful dudes that I know. Now when you ask him, Craig, are you passionate about trash? Did you see yourself going this way? Did you, was, is there a book that you read on all the the famous garbage man of, you know, <laughs> of course not. Yet he wakes up with joy to do his job. What is it? Number one, there's an opportunity. Meaning, some of us are excited and giving ourselves to learning a craft that there's no opportunity to carry out. Meaning, I'm gonna spend all my time doing this thing, and my family's gonna go broke. Now Craig had an opportunity. What else? Craig had a skill. Craig can get up at 3 a.m. Pushing, nobody likes that. Pushing himself to get in his car, drive to the stop, meet with his fellow employ uh, and, uh, his, his, his fellow co-workers, circle up and pray and ask the Lord to give them grace on their trip as they go out and do what? Here's the third thing. They go out and they meet needs. Do you know that this city would be overran with trash if there were no garbage men? You know that, right? It would be literally everywhere. I can take you to countries where they don't have garbage men and there's literally trash everywhere. But God in his kindness to Tampa has provided a sanitation system that takes care of the sanitation needs of the city. 
With no sanitation, you open the door for disease. You open the door for great harm. And Craig is out every morning, Monday through Friday, taking care of the needs of this city. Does he do that for God? Absolutely. But not because he's a Christian. He's doing it for God because God is the king of Tampa. In every city everywhere, this is his kingdom as well. So when we go out and pick up trash, as Martin Luther would say, it's literally the hand of God picking up trash off the street. When you go out and you stack shelves at Sweet Bay, you are making provision for people to come in and eat. Nobody provides apart from God. When you're crafting music, you're not just doing it so you can get more lights online. You're making something that serves people. God is a burden lifter. That's what our music does. God is a clarifier. God gives joy and happiness. And if our music does that to people, well, that by golly is what we're called to do. And it is God doing it through our music. God wants to keep up his earth. He wants to garden it. And he is putting you to work it. And when you're working it, you're doing the work of God. Therefore, we're good stewards with it. We embrace the difficulties when we don't feel like it. We go anyways. Because we know if we don't love what we're doing, there's always something to love in what we're doing. People being provided, God being provided for, God being glorified, and we are being made more like Jesus. Last point, I'm open up for questions. Many of us are not doing what we think we, we want to do. We're not. I see myself doing something else. But never forget that God wants to develop in you things at the entry level that may just ready you for the CEO level. That there is things that have to be developed in all of us. And we will absolutely miss who God is making us to be if all we can think about is, I got to get the heck out of here. Because you're absolutely putting to the side the fact that God is wanting to work in you and work in people. I'm making sure they're provided for. Take dignity, dignity in that. As Craig takes dignity in being a garbage man. Amen. Amen. Let me open up for questions. Good word. Q and A. Good word, bro. All right. One question right here. What's up, bro? Can, uh, make a CD and make the music and have it, and then we, are, you know, we're worshiping. But then there's the the business side, the submitting process, and all that. You know, how do we balance that out to where we're not being lazy in music submissions, and radio submissions, and contacting promoters and things like that, to where that overshadows the actual worship and the. You, you get what I'm saying? That's what you're saying. Yeah, I would say you don't balance. You don't do anything unless it's worship. If you can, with a clear conscience, doing good business, go about promoting your album, signing paperwork, getting distribution, whatever it is, if you can't do those things, then you shouldn't do it. One of the things that I had, uh, one of the issues that we had uh, coming up was uh, stolen programs, right? <laughs> I said, man, I was hoping he wouldn't talk about that. Free loops to get that crack. We didn't have no money. So you go online, download that thing, put the little crack code in, and you have four working free loops. In addition to that, remember one of my homies, Big D, some of y'all know him. Big D had Pro Tools, and we had thousands of dollars worth of plugins. And you know how much we paid for them? Zilch. And part of you is like, thank you, Lord, we can make music like the great Preach. <laughs> so there's your business side. Well, there's a prime example of, you may make music with that, 
The Lord may bless it, but you are wrong. And God is not pleased with it. So how do I worship with my programs, delete them, and buy them? Because I'm, worship is, I'm presenting this to God. I think about reach records and the way that we do business. People are shocked by the label. Y'all actually put out all y'all 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 artists. All y'all artists have albums regularly. No label does that. They shelf cats for years. People signed the labels. They forgot they were signed. <laughs> like no no no. This is bigger than us in numbers. This is getting a message out, and we feel like. Tadashi's voice is the same as the crazy voice. So we get behind both. It's merging and learning, getting around good, godly businessmen who've been down that path that can help you make those decisions. Because there's tough decisions after you made business too. And worship says, I'm going to make the ones that are honoring to God. So don't separate. See it as one continual motion. Giving thanks to God through all that. How many more questions do I have time for? You know what I'm saying? One more question. What's up, sir? Uh, Confusion. Say you have like the same circumstances where you can't muster up the work ethic for depression. Some people they they have like extraordinary circumstances where it's hard to muster up work ethic. Yeah. Like clinical depression or this scenario is going around. What would you say is like motivation to muster up that work work ethic in order to do uh, Yeah, that's an excellent, great level. question. You yeah. know, there's something to talk about and talk. Like, what's the point? Some of us, when we find ourselves overtaken by laziness, the first step may be just looking underneath the hood and saying, "Is there something chemical going on here? Is there something from my past that's interfering with my future?" And one of the steps to that is counseling, getting with some folks that can give direction, that can help you get to a place where nothing physically is holding you back from what you need to do spiritually. So I'm not a, a huge, I'm not, a, I'm not against it, but I'm not also not a, like a, a sponsor of a, a medication for depression. Um, I had a, a good friend of mine who uh, was clinically depressed for, for years. And it really wasn't until he got some, some medication that it helped him with the, the imbalance. And it got him to a place where he could read his Bible. But sometimes, if something is stopping me from partaking in the means of grace, and it's medical, sometimes we gotta address that medically. As a last result, being careful not to lead to more sin like addiction and abuse. But we do wanna do everything that we can to get us to a place where we can make decisions and receive uh, what God has before us. Yeah. So yeah, you definitely want to get counseling on whoever this is. Counseling, being careful, making sure that my health is in order. Uh, and then from that, it's just about obedience. Motivation and obedience. Scripture is filled with mot motivation. There's so many reasons, a hundred different reasons. as an understatement. To obey. Then it comes to obedience. Decide to do. And you'll find a lot of times that your heart, your motivation will follow your, your obedience.